Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Bagam Radian here at the Association of the United States Army's annual conference and trade show in Washington, D.C., the number one gathering of U.S. Army leaders from around the world. Our coverage here is sponsored by General Motors Defense, Bell, L3 Harris and Leonardo DRS, and it's our honor to be talking to Brigadier General Ross Kaufman, who is uh, the uh, lead for the cross-functional team for the next generation combat vehicle, which is a mouthful at the United States Army Futures Command, sir. It's a pleasure seeing you, and congratulations on the promotion. Thanks very much. I really am glad to be here. It's great, good to see you again. I think last year uh, is the first time we were on camera together, and so it's wonderful to be back here in Washington, D.C., and uh, on camera with you. Um, ab absolutely, and I know that I'm uh, I'm the last interview standing between you and a very well-earned drink at the end of this first day at uh, AUSA. Uh, let's talk about all of the work that's gone into um, getting you ready and where you are in the first year of the office. Very, very ambitious year, very busy year. Uh, you have one ongoing important, uh, uh, the optionally manned fighting vehicle program is in competition. There are some questions about that, but I'm gonna save that for a minute. Talk to us about what you, have, you and the team have accomplished over the past year as you're laying the foundation for this new family of next generation combat vehicles, some of them manned, some of them unmanned, uh, as you map out the future uh, armored war fighting capability of the Army. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, the decision was made to move to Detroit. Uh, I was sitting in Poland, I got a phone call, and they said, hey, you're gonna move to Detroit. I said, which combat division is in Detroit? And they said, well, it's not a combat division. You're gonna go build the new vehicles for our Army. And I said, you know, you've got Kaufman, it's COFFMN, is this the right call? And he said, absolutely, uh, you're going to go there and stand it up. You, uh, you thought it was a detailer's joke at the end of the day, right? Well, or a good friend, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, it's been one of the most valuable and rewarding assignments I've ever had. And so we started with zero, and uh, now we're up to almost 30 individuals up in Detroit. But more accurately... There are thousands of people in Detroit and across our Army that have come together to support us. It's really what Army Features Command is all about. Teamwork, uh, pulling together on a common goal, and in my case, that is building the next generation of combat vehicles. Our number one priority is the optionally manned fighting vehicle, the Bradley replacement. So it's no secret to you or anybody else that the Army's had some problems procuring a Bradley replacement for some time. There's been a lot of failures. Uh, I am confident that if industry meets our threshold requirements, uh, we're going to have the best fighting vehicle on earth. Um, well, let me um, ask you a little bit about that, right? I mean, Ryan Metal uh, and Raytheon were teamed, very good vehicle, but they were disqualified because they didn't get the vehicle to you in time. Uh, BAE Systems has said that they're not going to bid on the contract. And so ultimately, are you comfortable with having only one bidder, General Dynamics? Uh, you know, every one of these uh, companies has uh, you know, great offerings at the end of the day, otherwise they wouldn't be become involved. Are you able to have the kind of competition you wanted if you just have one vehicle that's competing for it? Yeah, but to be clear, uh, I'm fired walled off uh, from the evaluation of the proposals. Uh, I've read in the open press, just like you have, so there's a lot of hearsay around it, but what I, if I go back to, uh, if a vendor can deliver uh, our threshold requirements, then I think it's gonna be a great day for our soldiers. Um, and at, in 2023, on the back end of this EMD period, it's a free and open competition. So Ali Ali Income Free, if you've got a vehicle that can meet the, the requirements and you meet uh, what the Army has laid out before you, then you can compete there. Um, so I'm very excited about it. Uh, I'm about uh, in-state. I'm about results. Uh, I'm about getting the best equipment in the hands of our soldiers. Uh, as we look at competition. There's competition and there's lots of ways to do that uh, throughout the procurement process. Uh, and we have experts. Our PEO, uh, Major General Brian Cummings, they don't come any better than him. And uh, I am confident that we will get not only a great vehicle, uh, but we'll get it in our hands of our soldiers faster than any combat vehicle has been developed uh, in recent memory. From, from your standpoint, right, you have a lot of experimentation work that's going on uh, in autonomy. Um, or an, an incredible breacher exercise, which was fully autonomous, was conducted recently by the United States Army, which I think was um, set a record in terms of the degree of autonomy that the vehicle operated under. Um, talk to us a little bit about how some of that research is going into fully mapping out what the future family of combat vehicles for the United States Army are. Yeah, so real quick on autonomy. Uh, I don't want a fully autonomous vehicle because a fully autonomous vehicle would think on its own. I want a vehicle 
that has the level of autonomy that keeps a person in the loop to control it, to control the firing of the weapon systems, tell it where it needs to go. I want that vehicle to do exactly what humans want it to do. Uh, so I'm, we're not trying to build Terminator here. What we're trying to build is a vehicle that takes uh, a burden and risk off of our soldiers. Uh, so between the robotic combat vehicles and the optionally manned fighting vehicle, and one day the optionally manned tank, uh, what we don't want to reduce the number of soldiers in the Army. What we want to do is re reduce the risk to those soldiers. You mentioned the combined arms breach they did fully robotic. Um, that is just an exceptional way uh, to test out and experiment with the level of autonomy and robotics that we have uh, available to us. I mean, look, industry is moving really fast in this space, but they're doing it on road. We've got to do it off road, and we've got to do it faster and better than our adversary, because you can bet anyone that we will fight in the future is going to have robots. But I have confidence in the United States of America that our industry partners will build the best robots, give us more options on the battlefield than anywhere in the world. Um, how far out do you think that is? Because if you talk to a lot of people in commercial industry, there's a little bit of a debate of whether that's a further out thing or it's a much closer thing. And as you mentioned, it's a lot easier on roads. You have a lot of cues to go after, whereas um, anybody who's been in an armored vehicle knows something could look okay until the minute it really doesn't, and then you have a broken track, and you, you, you know, you got to break a lot of wrenches and, and put a lot of manpower into it. Yeah, so... It takes us approximately seven to nine years to train a staff sergeant in the United States Army to get into a M1 tank and traverse uh, terrain off-road in an appropriate manner. They don't show the underbelly. They don't go over the, the top of the hill. Uh, they, they flow over the ground like water. It's a really hard skill to learn. And so the machines are not ready for that. 2035 is my best guess. So when, when technology will allow that. Um, but what we can do is we can execute operations with, with robots forward of man positions. We can control them. We, we can have the pipes available to give us real-time uh, observation and allow humans to make decisions when to pull the trigger, when to maneuver, and when to bring the man force up. Um, what is the kind of lethality you want on these platforms? If you look at it, a new generation of missiles are getting very are much smaller, much longer range, much higher speed, but also incredible warhead power off of some of these systems. What's the blend that you want from direct fire cannon? What do you want that's missile carrier? Do you see a future main battle tank, for example, not being something which is actually gun primary, but missile primary, not to do a shillelagh redux or anything right. like that, but something which is a really, really useful uh, val cost, cost, um, you know, a, an, an economical uh, round that can come out of that or an economical missile that come out of it. What's the sort of balance that you see as you look at everything from directed energy to missiles to yeah. tube dark? It's tube a great cannon. question because it, it's a challenge, right? So a cheap missile is hard to find. And a missile that uh, can travel at the round or at the rate that a tank round can is impossible to find right now, right? right? So when you're, when you're traveling a mile a second, uh, it's a lot different than, you know, 14 to 10 to 14 seconds of a missile getting three kilometers away. So we, we've got we've to really strike a balance here. So as I've said before, particularly with the decisively lethal option, so on the heavy variant, anything is on the table. You know, if it's shooting lasers, we want to look at it. We want this thing to be decisively lethal, and we're all focused on one thing, and that's defeating the enemy. So as you look out there what our potential adversaries are going to fight us with, we need our robots to be able to defeat that. And uh, whether it's a light, medium, or heavy variant, uh, we can scale the, uh, the firepower on each of these to really give our soldiers a, an advantage. Do you, uh, do you see... Um uh, how are you thinking about the um, cyber-enabled elements of this, the electromagnetic spectrum element of this? Because if you look at that future battle space, it is going to be something that's going to be highly contested on each one of these uh, spectrums. How much thought are you putting into the cyber piece? How much thought are you putting into the uh, electronic warfare and electromagnetic warfare elements of it? A huge amount. So as we develop the requirements, we are absolutely consulting with the experts in and out of the Army to get the requirements correct. Because we know that the enemy's gonna come at us in the electromagnetic spectrum. We know they're going to try to take over our, our robots. We know that uh, the enemy sees that as a vulnerability. You know why? Because it is. Anything is hackable. But I am very confident that our requirements and what the efforts we're conducting in this space 
are going to be better than our adversary and protect our men and women on the battlefield. Um, let me ask you a last question um, about power. Ground combat vehicle experimented with a whole vast assortment of hybrid power options. The United States Army has been looking to uh, try to free itself from the tyranny of energy or at least try to get greater range, get um, more quiet operations, right? Having a, um, a, you know, a 1,500 horsepower gas turbine running on a tank is a loud thing. If you can figure out how to move that tank uh, on electric propulsion or something else, it's a heck of a lot quieter. You can be in overwatch for longer periods of time without having a donkey engine running in the, in the bustle of your uh, turret. Um, full disclosure, General Motors uh, Defense is one of our sponsors. But at what point are you going to entertain things like fuel cells? Uh, battlefield power is something which is at a premium, and there are a number of different sorts of ways of trying to get there. Um, what are your thinking on electric, on hybrid, on fuel cells, on any one of a whole vast array of alternative power sources that can give you that kind of power density on a battlefield, be useful, but also reduce the operational fuel load because there are lives tied to each gallon of gas that you're moving forward. 100% on board. Uh, hybrid electric, uh, making our vehicles more fuel efficient, absolutely something that we want our vehicles in the future to have. Uh, so as industry has our requirements uh, and they deliver a hybrid electric option, that's welcome, right? Because just as you said, we have to move fuel all over the battlefield. Hydrogen, I currently, as of today, I don't think we're there yet, right? It's a whole nother level of uh, logistics to get hydrogen around the battlefield. If it gets hit with a bullet, it's not necessarily a good thing. Um, so th there's some, but we're continuing to work in that space to see, okay, what is in the realm of the possible? You know, there's some really exciting solid hydrogen out there uh, that shows potential. Not today, but you know, in 15, 20 years, potentially. Um, fully battery powered, uh, that sounds great, but how do you recharge them? And so kind of the, the mark on the wall that I've put for our science and technology community is, when you can recharge that battery as fast as you can uh, fill up a tank, then we probably got it about right, but we're not there yet. And uh, last question on active protection. Yeah. Active protection, uh, part of our requirements uh, for the obsolete man fighting vehicle, uh, huge believer. Uh, I think RPGs can be defeated today, missiles uh, can be defeated, and, and there's, some, there's some nuances with uh, both of those. Uh, long rod penetrators, hard to defeat, really kind of gold standard. And uh, we're, lo we're looking at hard kill, soft kill, reactive armor, all of that for our vehicles, particularly the man ones. The, for the robots, perhaps just we're, we're just going to defeat those uh, at range. But, you know, when I look at robots, you've got a trittable, you've got uh, expendable, and then you have human. So expendable, least expensive, least armored, a trittable, a little more armor, and then human, we got a, the full Monty. And uh, do you have um, a weight limit in mind? I mean, I remember when uh, General Corelli uh, was driven by a lot of passion to say, hey, look, if the vehicle's got to be 150 tons, so be it. But we also need to be able to move these vehicles. Do you have sort of a, a target weight in mind, whether it's in the 50s or the 60s, to give you a little bit of growth room? What's the sort of benchmarks you're setting for each one of these vehicle uh, classes? Yeah, so for the robots or for the... Uh, I, either way, right, as you're, as you're okay, thinking about so the whole thing. Uh, bottom line is, there's a few places on Earth that we think we may fight in the future. We've looked at the infrastructure uh, in those places and have made weight class determinations so that we can traverse bridges. You know, roads won't collapse. Um, so we really we don't want to be over 50 tons. Uh, that, that's really a, a benchmark for us. And industry has is, is, uh, been very positive in that regard. So we, we think we can get there. Um, but it's all about the enemy, it's all about where you want to fight and picking weights that are going to be more conducive to your success. Brigadier General Ross Kaufman, uh, who is the director of the cross-functional team uh, at the U.S. Army Futures Command that is overseeing the next generation combat vehicles. Uh, sir, thanks very much again, really appreciate, appreciate it. You. And uh, look forward to staying in touch and coming and seeing you in uh, sunny Detroit. Thanks there again. Take care.